Welcome to this week's Torah portion, and we're starting a whole new book of the Torah. We saw you um, last year when we finished off, I think it was with the life of Sarah, or around uh, there. And so um, we actually missed discussing a big chunk of Genesis that I really love, and that's the story of Joseph. Grant Luton always says that um, there's no character in the word of God that represents our Messiah more than Joseph. And there's so many similarities between them. It's a wonderful study to go and do. So today we start uh, the story of the Exodus. And I, I believe that last year we discussed the whole thing with the Hebrew name of Shemot being Exodus and how it got to be named Exodus. So I'm not going to go into that again in this Torah portion. Um, oh, there we go. So today we're going to focus on um, the following. We're going to focus on the dangers of spiritual immaturity. We're going to talk about ruling over the serpent, the dangers of assimilation and idolatry. And I'm going to try my best to tie all of this together with what we find in this week's Torah portion. Now, I think we've spoken about this so many times, but there's so much prophecy that's in the book of, uh, in the books of Moses, in the Torah, in the first five books of Moses. In fact, the sages of Israel say, if Moses is the body of a man, then the prophets are his two legs. And I think that's such a beautiful way to explain how the Torah and the prophets really go together. And I'm always a bit amused when people try and um, teach about Bible prophecy without going back to the Torah. Because the word of God says that God spoke to Moses face to face, not in parables and stories and riddles like he spoke to the other prophets. So we need to go back to these books to really understand Bible prophecy. And many people say, you know, they want to know what's going to happen. And uh, what's well, if you want to know what's going to happen, you need to go and look, especially at the book of Exodus. We need to go and look at the story of Israel and how God set them free, but also how they got into this place of idolatry, this place of oppression, of trials and tribulations in the first place. Um, and we see that uh, Egypt, the name Egypt is Mitzrayim. It means... Um, I can't get the right word now, but it's basically constriction, suffering. Um, but in that suffering, we really do mature. You know, we don't um, grow our character and develop our character and mature spiritually in the good times. It's in the tough times that we see God building our character, purifying us and bringing maturity. And so it's the same with the Israelites. God allowed them to go into this land and in this place of constriction, there was an opportunity for them to grow and mature. It's kind of like a womb. And, you know, a, a womb is a, a great place for a baby to be that first nine months. But when you overstay your time in the womb, when you miss the birth, when you want to stay there where you are familiar with everything, even if it's tough, then it's death that takes place. So the place of life can become a place of death. They went into Egypt because of a famine. They were saved by going into Egypt. But there was a time when they had to leave and they had a choice. And you've got a choice. And it's all part of maturing spiritually. Excuse me. So it's a time to mature. And if you don't mature, you are going to be at risk. Because I've never looked at this story the way that I've looked at it this time. And what's interesting is that if you go and look at what happened with the people in Egypt and you ask yourself who were really at risk, who did they try to kill? It was the babies that they tried to kill. And so in that is a lesson for us because the spirit of the end times is the same spirit that is working through Pharaoh. It's what we saw working through Herod. In Yeshua's time, it's what we see standing up right now against people that are believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, people that hold on to the truth of his word and his commandments. It's that spirit that wants to kill, but it doesn't kill the adults. It doesn't kill the mature believers. It goes after the immature believer. And I believe in this is a warning for all of us. If there are areas of your life that you are still immature, for the times that we are going in, 
you are going to be at risk. And so this is really a teaching to call you and to um yeah, to, to get you to understand that you need to get to a place of spiritual maturity, especially in those areas where you can identify yourself as still being a spiritual baby. So what we see is that Moses was a great example of a mature believer because that staff that he had, there's a picture in that of maturity for us as well. We see Moses when he was immature, he knew that he had a calling on his life. He knew God wanted to use him to set the people free. Um, but he wasn't mature enough to know how to do it. So he did it the only way he knew how, out of his own strength and his own flesh. And he ended up killing a man. <clears throat> and so Moses had to flee into the wilderness. And that's our story very often as well. When we are immature, God takes us into the wilderness. And that is a place of purification. That is also a place where we come to be mature in the Messiah. So when Moses comes out of that 40 years in the wilderness and God has matured him, he has this encounter and we see that he controls the snake. The snake does not control him. And this is a sign of a mature believer as well. And what's interesting is that when you look at the original Hebrew, that the two places that we see Moses's staff turning into a snake are actually two different Hebrew words. In Exodus 4 verse 3, the word used is nachash, and that means snake. But when it goes into Pharaoh's court, we see it in Exodus 7 verse 12, it says tamim. And that means sea monster or dragon. And even in that is a picture for us, because when Moses is alone, he has control over the snake. And we know that the snake goes back to the garden, goes back to deception. That's your own soul. But when he goes and he faces the spirit of the Antichrist, that's a spiritual battle. That's a warfare going on. It's something bigger. It's the dragon. And we see that Moses even rules over that through the authority that God gave him. So the picture for us is that if you are mature, as you mature as a believer, that you will rule over that which was in the garden. You will not be susceptible to deception, false doctrine, and temptation. You will rule over that which is from the earth. And remember, we are from the earth, and that's your soul. But once you have gotten control over that, once you are no longer controlled by your soul, but you are the one controlling your soul, then you step up in the spirit and you can face the dragons, the beast, the spirits and the evil entities of the air, because that is a more mythical creature, a tanin, and that is from the sea and it represents the spirit. So in this, we see that in the 40 years of maturing that Moses went through, the fruit that he was mature was the fact that he was not controlled by the serpent, but that he had victory over the serpent. So if you are not controlling over, or you're not ruling over these two serpents, you don't have victory over your own soul, and you don't have victory in spiritual warfare, it means there's still uh, maturing that needs to take place. And so, like I said, the whole mission of the spirit of the Antichrist is to kill the immature believer. And I think if there's ever a time for, for us as children of God to take um, stock of our lives and of our spirit man, it is now because we are definitely going into the time of the serpent again. We see this in Revelation. In Revelation 13, we see the beast coming out of the earth, just like the Nachash, and we see the beast coming out of the sea, just like the Tanin. And again, when we see this beast, where is he? He's waiting in the wilderness. He's waiting for the baby to be born. So we should be praying even, not just for ourselves, but our loved ones that we know are still struggling with immaturity because the times we're going in are going to be very tough for those that are immature. And then, you know, the question is, why does the spirit go after the babies? Why doesn't he go after everyone? Why didn't Pharaoh kill all the Israelites? Why did he say, let's kill the babies? 
And it's because he's actually weak. The enemy is not as strong as he would want us to believe. And so he goes after the weak. He goes after the vulnerable. And if you decide to stay spiritually immature, that makes you vulnerable. We see this warning going out even to the new believers coming into the faith of Messiah. In Hebrews 5 verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, because of the time you have had to learn these truths, you actually need someone to teach you again the elementary principles of God's word from the beginning. And you have come to be continually in need of milk, not solid food. And it's so sad because I can see this in today's um, believers' lives as well. Many people have been in churches and congregations and have gone from one conference to another. And we have so much that we've been fed, but we are still immature. We still don't have a good grasp on the elementary principles. The moment we see the beginning, we must know, go back to Genesis. We have no idea what's going on in the first five books of the Bible, but we've been in the body of Messiah for years. And that's why we are still consuming spiritual milk and we are not eating solid food. That's why many of us that call ourselves believers don't have the ability to sit with someone and share the word of God because we don't know the word of God. So let's look at some of the attributes of immature believers. And I said some for a reason, because this is by no means all of it. I looked for those attributes that fit in with what I am trying to teach today in terms of idolatry and judgment and assimilation and this whole story of Israel in Egypt. So we see that when you are immature, you are not disciplined in your faith. It's easy to be deceived. Do you know how many people are deceived? If someone has a good argument and a good scripture to back it, and you don't know context, you don't know the rules of learning and teaching the word of God, you don't know the word of God, it's so easy to just believe. And many people that are deceived will say, but my pastor says, or my this or that says. And the problem is you don't know the word yourself. There's no endurance. So one of the things that you will find with people that are spiritually immature is that the moment that God does not answer my prayer or it takes a bit too long or it doesn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen, God doesn't come through for me the way that I've asked him to come through. It's just getting too tough. It's too difficult. I can't do this. There's no endurance that you would see with the mature believers. And then just like a baby, if you are spiritually immature, you want to be comfortable. You want to be satisfied. I just want to hear a message that makes me feel good, that motivates me. And so that's one of the attributes of being immature. And then this is a very important one because this goes back to Moses being able to rule over the Nahash, the serpent, and that is to... Rule over your thoughts, your emotions, your will, your desires. Because the spiritually immature, they are still very much driven by what they think and what they feel and what they want. And you can see it in how they live. Yeshua said you will know a tree by its fruit. So many people have a good testimony and they say the right words and they do the right things at the right times when people are watching. But what is the fruit that your family is tasting when no one's watching? Because that will also show if you are a mature believer or not. And then lastly, and that's the big one, is compromise. And I think that's something that is very media and culturally driven today as well. You know, acceptance of everything and everyone and, and compromise. And that goes directly against the word of God. God says, you are set apart. You are holy. Be holy for I am holy. There is no place for compromise in the kingdom of God. And immature believers are quick to compromise because they don't like the conflict and they don't know the word of God. So many people would ask, but why, why did God allow 
the Egyptians to oppress the Israelites so severely. And to answer that, we need to go back to the story itself. Because initially, when God sent Israel into Egypt, Israel prospered. Remember, Egypt had just gone through a terrible drought. And if you read the story, um, Joseph caused the Egyptians to sell everything they had, even themselves, to the government. So the government owned every Egyptian, all of their land, all of their livestock, all of their possessions. And Israel comes in with all of their livestock, with all of their possessions, with all of their riches, and the government does not own them. And so the first few years, or quite a while, when Israel lived in Egypt, they were very blessed. And it went really well with them until they started to compromise, until they started to assimilate into the culture, until they also wanted to look Egyptian and be Egyptian and be accepted. I don't want to stand out. I just want to be part of the crown. And the problem with that is that the moment that we assimilate into our culture and traditions, it always leads to idolatry. And like I said, God says, be set apart. I want you to be different. I don't want you to fit in. In fact, there's a scripture somewhere in the New Testament, I just can't recall where now, that says, if you look like the world, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with the way you're living as a believer. So God does not want us to assimilate. And what was so profound, I think it was Bill Cloud that I listened to that said that you can live in Egypt. You know, we live in this world. And this is where we are right now. In fact, God says that he scatters us into the nations to be a light unto the nations. We need to be different so that they can look at us and ask, what is different about you? So you can live in Egypt, but Egypt should never live in you. And that really made me think of how many things are we doing, uh, traditions that we have that causes Egypt to live in us. Instead of standing out and being different, we just want to be the same. And so idolatry starts to live inside of us. So like I said, you know, Israel prospered until they actually assimilated, until they did not want to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the way that he wanted to be worshipped. They didn't totally let go of him. They just mixed in some of the ways and practices that the Egyptians would worship their God. And that's where the problem started. And that's actually where the road to redemption started for them as well. You know, you cannot redeem something that did not belong to you in the first place. And so Israel belonged to God because he had a covenant with them. And the enemy thought that he was going to destroy Israel. He thought that through the oppression, he was going to destroy them. Have you ever asked yourself, why did Pharaoh tell them to throw the male babies into the Nile and to kill the male children and not the female? Because the male carries the seed and the male is the one that imparts something into the woman who then takes it and then brings forth life. So that even shows us that Pharaoh was happy to keep the Israelite women alive because they could marry the Egyptian men and they could receive the Egyptian seed and assimilate into the Egyptian culture. And that's why I wanted to kill the male babies. But what's so amazing about the story is that the very thing that Satan tried to use to destroy Israel ended up serving God's purpose. And that's the same thing in your lives. Whatever the enemy tries to use to destroy you, it's going to end up serving God's purpose anyway. Because sometimes the only thing that brings us to our senses is when we hit rock bottom, is when things go really, really bad. Because what's the first thing we do then? Just like the Israelites, suddenly we remember our God and we start calling out to our God. And so although Israel saw themselves as being like the Egyptians, God raised up an Egyptian leader to tell them and show them, you're not the same, you're different. 
And sometimes when we get oppressed by the world and the worldly systems, we get upset by it. But actually God is using it to show us you are different. Accept that rejection from the world. I want you to know that I've called you to be a set of God nation, a kingly priesthood. So Pharaoh is a tool in God's hand. Everything Pharaoh did was to reject Israel, to show them that they're different. And in that, Pharaoh actually reminded them of who they are. He reminded them of their identity. So through oppression, God brings redemption. And I don't know if you read through this week's Torah portion, but you know, when when something is referenced and you, and you think to yourself, wow, this makes me think of that story, then you need to go and read that other story again because the word of God is so amazing. And in this week's Torah portion, there's something that's mentioned that actually takes us back to the last Torah portion that I did last year, which is the life of Sarah. It's the very last one that I presented. And the connection between this week's Torah portion and last week's Torah portion is we see Moses at a well and there was Rebecca at the well. And both of these stories had many things in common. We see Moses giving water to the sheep. Rebecca gave water to the camels. Moses meets his wife at the well and Eliezer is meeting Rebecca and he went to go and fetch a wife for Isaac. So these two stories, we need to put them next to each other and compare them and see what is this trying to teach us. And if you delve a little bit deeper into the life of Moses and the life of Rebecca, there's some amazing insights that we can get that fits into this whole topic of assimilation and idolatry and judgment. So let's see why the Torah is pointing us back to the story of Rebecca. If you read closely, you'll see that Rebecca was actually still very young. It speaks of her nursemaid that went with her. Interestingly enough, in this week's Torah portion, it's also speaking about the nursemaid. Um, and even in that, we see a picture of the Holy Spirit. The female, um, if it speaks of the sister or the woman or the wife, it always represents the Holy Spirit. And the nursemaid is someone that takes care of, the comforter. Um, so even in that is a picture for us to pray for the Lord to raise up people that can be nursemaids during this time because there are still going to be a lot of baby believers coming into faith. And we need to be interceding for them, helping them, being patient with them, treating them with love and kindness, and helping them to mature as quickly as possible. So Rebecca is still very young, and Rebecca is in a place of idolatry. Eliezer went to go and fetch her out of a home, out of a town, out of a place of idolatry, just like Israel is finding themselves in a place of idolatry. And when Eliezer said to her, come with me, her family said, don't let her just stay another 10 more days. But she didn't tell me. She didn't want to stay. She said, I will go immediately. And so I want to encourage you, when God speaks to you about an idol in your life, don't tell you. Don't leave it for tomorrow. Just don't nurse it for another day or two. Go like Rebecca. Leave it behind immediately and where does Rebecca go she goes into a place of sojourning just like Israel is going to go into the wilderness and live in tents we know that Rebecca's tent was a miraculous place the um the Midrash the Hebrew folklore tells us that there were miracles linked to her tent like um, her uh, Shabbat candles never going out. So that's representative also of the presence of the Holy Spirit, even of the tabernacle and the menorah never going out in the tabernacle. So where does Rebecca go? She goes from this place of absolute defilement and idolatry. To, she travels a far distance into a place of sojourning. And she goes into the tent, into the covenant, into the house of God. And in that place of covenant, there she matures. And so that's that's where we will mature as well. If you're asking yourself at this moment, sure, 
I know there are places of immaturity, but how do I mature? You're going to mature inside covenant. In that place where you spend time with God, in that place where you study the word of God, in that place of intimacy with God, that is the only place where maturing will take place. And now I want to show you something amazing because we're going to look at Moses and and this basket that he was placed in, and even the month that we found ourselves in, and it's all going to tie back to the story of Rebecca. We see in the Hebrew that Moses was placed in a tavat, and a tavat means basket. And I don't know if you are aware, but the Hebrew calendar is slightly different from the calendar that we grew up following, and it goes from one new moon to the next new moon. And so we are currently in the month of Tevet. So you can see if you look at the word Tevat and the word Tevet, that they are very similar. Now, I don't believe in coincidences. So I find it profound that we have this Torah portion now and that we see that the one that was the savior of Israel that set them free from the place of idolatry and led them to the covenant was placed in a basket and that we are studying this in the month of Tevet. Now it gets even better because the Hebrew word for the basket is spelled with a taf and the Hebrew word for the month is spelled with a tet. So the tevat, tevet, the only difference between those two words is a tav and a tet. So then I was curious, okay, so what does a tav and a tet mean? So interestingly enough, the tav is part of the Hebrew word for the basket, and that is the final letter of the alphabet. It's also the number 400, and it means truth, perfection, and completion. So this is linked to the basket, but look at this. Look at the link between the basket and the months. Tet, the Hebrew letter Tet, that is used to spell this month's name, actually means basket. How amazing is that? And it also means transformation. And then when you look further into the month of Tibet, you see that Tibet is also associated with the tribe of Dan. Now, every Hebrew month, there are 12 Hebrew, Hebrew months, every Hebrew month is associated with one of the tribes of Israel. And just look at this. Genesis 49 verse 16 to 17 says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. So the sign for the tribe of Dan was also a serpent. So can you see how this all ties back to Moses' staff ruling over the serpent, the month of Tibet being the month of judgment? We also see the start of the book of Exodus where God says, I'm going to judge the idols in the lives of the Egyptians. I'm going to judge these idols. And this is the time that we find ourselves in. It's a time of judgment. And it's specifically linked to idolatry in Israel. So all of the uh, bad things that have happened to Israel have been historically related to Tevet. We see the siege of Jerusalem in 588 BCE and the destruction of both the temples. Um, and we also see it's the time where God sets this whole plan in motion to take them out of this place of idolatry. What's also interesting is that if we look at Dan and Ephraim, there are quite a lot of Bible verses that speak of the idolatry that these two tribes specifically went into. Dan was the first tribe of all 12 tribes that fell into idolatry, and we find this in Judges 18 verse 30. But then in Hosea, we also see God saying that there's multiple altars of idolatry, and he is so tired of Ephraim and the idolatry in Ephraim's life. He's so tired that he actually says, I'm going to return Ephraim to Egypt. I'm going to send you back to the place of idolatry. 
And the reason that I wanted to point out these two names of these two tribes is that if you go back to Revelation 7 verse 4 and you look at the tribes being listed there, these are the two tribes that are not listed. We see Manasseh listed as one of the half tribes that are usually listed with Ephraim, but Ephraim's name is not listed at all. Dan is removed and Joseph is listed, where Joseph is usually not listed because he was replaced by the two half tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. So what do we learn from this? Does this mean that, oh goodness, we've lost two tribes? Does it mean oh, be aware that you're not part of the tribe of Dan or Ephraim because you're not going to be one of the 144,000. What, what can we glean from this? And I think it's actually something quite positive. And it's based on something that Belisa said in one of her teachings. She pointed out that the word of God says that every tribe of the sons of Israel were sealed. That means that although their names are not mentioned, that they are still there. Um, and what she then pointed out was that because their names are not listed, but the word says that they are all there, it's a sign for us that Israel has been purified. That the two names that represented idolatry in Israel have been purified. And that is the message to us as well. Whatever is in you, that is still filled with idolatry, by the time we get to Revelation, it will be purified. God will remove it. We, we will be a bride that stands before him without spot or wrinkle if we allow him to remove the idolatry from our lives. And I want to finish off with a final thought about the helper. Because throughout this um. Throughout this passage, in especially this first Torah portion, we often see mention of women. It's a lot of women in this story. And it always represents the Holy Spirit. And we see in John 16, verse 7 to 8, Yeshua saying that he's going to send the helper. And he says, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So we see that with the judgment comes the Holy Spirit and he's the one that convicts us concerning sin. And we know that sin is transgressing the commandments of the Torah. That's what the New Testament says. Where do we learn about righteousness? We learn how to live a righteous life through the commandments. And we learn about judgment from the Torah as well, because God says, choose today, put before you life or death, blessing or curse. So we need to ask the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and show us where are we still in sin? Where are we not walking in righteousness? And where will we face judgment if we do not repent? So like I said, in Exodus 2 specifically, there's a lot of women. We've got Moses' mother and sister. We've got Pharaoh's daughters and her young women. We've got the seven daughters of the priests of Midian. And when you hear seven, you know the seven manifestations of the Spirit of God. And then it specifically mentions Zipporah, uh, Moses' wife. And if you go and look at what her name means, her name means bird. So there's so many clues, especially in Exodus 2, that is telling us that the way out of this place of idolatry, the way out of this place of spiritual immaturity is by allowing the Holy Spirit to help us and to guide us. And the Holy Spirit will always take us back to the covenant of God and to the commandments. And what's so amazing for me is that if you read this story, you'll see that it's actually the woman that sorted the plans of Pharaoh. It's the Holy Spirit that will help us to overcome the spirit of the Antichrist in the end times. So a few things to consider as we finish up this teaching is to ask the Holy Spirit to show you where are you in compromise and where have you assimilated into the culture. Ask the Lord to deal with your idols and also ask him to show you how can you grow up spiritually. I just want to finish off with something that I shared earlier in this week um, about a word that God gave me for this year of 2024. And I got that word before 
I did this teaching. And as I started preparing for this Torah portion, I was just amazed to see how the word that God gave me about the idols in our lives that will be judged, about a time of purification and cleaning, and um, how it fits in perfectly with the month of Tibet that I did not realize was the month of judgment, the month of Dan, and also with this Torah portion that we find ourselves in this week. So I really hope that this has blessed you. I'll share that link uh, to that podcast in the description of this um, Torah portion as well. Shabbat Shalom.